first you take a five day journey on horseback. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, getting the rawhide, cutting the rawhide out, getting the porcupine quills, cleaning them, washing them, dyeing them to the colors that you want them, and then wrapping it. So it's a good process. It takes a lot of time, patience, and then once you do get the quills, you gotta sort them and get the right size that you want for the project. It is kind of relaxing to me when I have the, the time to sit down and to do it. When I was in high school is when I really was seeking out who I was as a Dakota through ceremonies. That's where I became more interested in who I was, where my people come from, what our, our name was, our traditional name, to learn more about the history of who we are. And then in my adult, adulthood, uh, just recently, four years ago, is when I started to seek out the arts. I always take it as it's an opportunity to do something that I'm not comfortable with. And then the more I live, the more I've grown to respect those teachings. And the more I try to teach those teachings. When elders shared with me stories, I share with the younger generation to my best ability. Quill working or quill work is a, a traditional art form that the Dakota, Lakota, Nakota were pre-contact. So it was something that we used to decorate our clothes, our pipe bags, medicine. It was our beads before trading came across. So it goes back a long time. My great-grandmother, her name was Lucy Iron Boy. She had a quill work dress, and um, my father, he had quill work on his dance outfit, a grass dance outfit. And so that was the initial inspiration, was to find out how that was done, but also to locate someone in my community or other communities that I was familiar with to find out if anyone still did that. And it, it was unfortunate at the time in the early 70s where I didn't locate very many people that knew about the art form itself. Now, it's becoming rare for quill work. It's old, old art. It was here before we had beadwork and the traders and that. On the old way, they had quill work. In 1978, the Indian Freedom of Religion Act was, was passed. And prior to that, we were practicing our ways, but we were doing so more or less underground. And so people held on to traditions and customs and language, arts, and those types of things. They, they held on to them, but we had to do them secretively. It was a, a trauma issue because they were adults that had to live through the impact of the Indian Court of Offenses. And so a, a lot of things were kept pretty close within families and extended families, communities like that. It wasn't as open during the early 1900s and all the way up into the, the 50s and the 60s and 70s. <laughs> It's tough growing up in two worlds as an indigenous person of North America. Not being able to be who we are, not being able to practice all of our way of life is passed down through generations of the oppression that was put on us. So the traditional art is helping me grow, heal, to do my part to pass this on. Our people always say seven generations. 
So seven generations prayed for me so I'd be able to do this. So I'm trying to do my best for the seven generations after me to be able to do this art form where it's so deeply in our DNA. So that's my motivation is somebody suffered and passed the tradition on. So I'm trying to do my best to do that. Sometimes, especially when we had the Removal Act originating after the 1862, it was through the Removal Act that we were separated and a lot of the people from different bands came over here up and down the east, eastern part of South Dakota and all on up into North Dakota, on up into Canada. So there, there was a lot of impact from being uh, disenfranchised from our original homelands. I think the impact was a loss, a loss of our close kinship ties. We were impacted with that loss of not being able to go a short distance and visit a relative, for instance, you know, not being able to acquire knowledge through ceremonial activity passed on through our elders to our younger generations of people. I uh, was working at the casino and Dakota Wachohan uh, organization in Morton offered uh, apprenticeships with uh, Master Quiller and at the time, it was supposed to be Hope Two Hearts. And she asked me if I was interested in learning how to do quill work. A split second said yes. You know, she said, well, I'm looking for four students. Uh, I'd really like you to be one of my students. So I just waited and something happened with her. So they had to replace her with Dave Lewis from Siston, South Dakota. And I just kept checking on uh, with Dakota Wachohan, you know, did you guys select your uh, students? Because Hope asked me, I told him. So I was throwing names out there to try to get um, in the program, and I was selected. So Dave did all of his own research. He went into museums and looked at the stuff that they had in their collection and taught himself, which took him 40 years to get to now, where he taught me in a five month period to the wrapping technique and the sew down technique. So very thankful for his research that he did and all the work he put into keeping quill work alive and passing it on. I can't thank him enough for doing that and being willing to pass it on to myself. The way I show my appreciation is teaching it, you know, what he has taught me to pass it on, to keep it alive. You either have a choice to take the opportunity or let it go by. The opportunity when it was presented to me, I, I said, why, why not? You know, why not try it? You know, maybe this will help me in some way. And with the past four years of doing quill work, it really helped me grow as a Dakota man, pursuing uh, the traditional art form and helping me grow as, a, as an individual to know more about myself and who I, where I come from. Well, my name is Georgina Drapel. My mother is Hope Two Hearts. She is a master quiller. It wasn't until I got older that I really sat down and took the time to learn it. 
There was just a lot of things going on in my life. I could take that and turn it into art. She wanted her children to learn the art so it wouldn't get lost. And I feel really good to have my mom in my life to have taught me the different things about quill work and what it means to us. And I can take that and pass it on to my children. Quill work and just the form of the medicine wheel does offer a lot of protection. It means a lot to our people. When I am wearing quill work, it kind of gives that remembrance of who I am and where I come from. A lot of times growing up, there's just ugly people in the world and they make it hard. But when I come back to quill work or beadwork or anything like that, it it makes me feel better about being Native American. A lot of our Indian people of different tribes, we've come and we hit this wall. And this wall that we're hitting is really tall and it's hard to get over it. And in that, you have suicides. In that, you have poverty. In that, you have drugs and alcohol. All these things that we're trying to overcome. And so the people here in our own tribe, the people got together and they said, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna save our children? So overwhelming. The adults, the elders, we all got together put our minds together and said, what can we do to save our children, to help our children, to build our nation? And what they had come across was art, spirituality, our Indian ways, this pipe way that is all wakam, that's holy. But if you can get those kids to go to sweat and to do beadwork, to do moccasins, to do earrings, to do quill work. All of that is gonna help balance out all this negativity, these things that kids have. I truly believe that if they have Indian teachings in their life, they're gonna be, they're gonna have the tools. It's a beautiful way, but it's something to combat this other side that we, that we have here, we're faced with. So all these different tools you're getting is to help the kids to better themselves and get interested in something. And if they finish something, oh my God, they have such pride. It's, it's beautiful. So yeah, that's what we came up with and that's what we presently be doing. And for now, it's helping our children. We're creating a healthy world. Dakota Wichoha, that's the Indian way of life. That's what we want for our nation, for our kids, for ourselves. And you can do that through quill work because it's a spiritual being. Seeing my niece working on quill work in my home is beautiful. <laughs> it's uh, something I didn't ever dream that I would be somewhat of a teacher to her of this art form. It makes me very proud that she has took the opportunity and is doing really well at keeping it alive. When you have an opportunity, take it and being willing to give anything a shot because there's always a plan for us and it all comes together of who we are as Dakotas. It's the language, the arts, the ceremonies. It all helps ourselves so we can help our people. Visit pioneer.org slash postcards to catch up on missed episodes and to find out more about your favorite segments.
This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4th, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. Live Wide Open, a regional movement that encourages people to make a great life for themselves in West Central Minnesota. More at LiveWideOpen.com. Alexandria, Minnesota, a year round destination with hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for memorable vacations and events. More information at ExploreAlex.com.